Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Martin Stafford Bell. I'm the medical director of Canberra Fertility Centre. Uh, I just sent Sam out to try and find our fourth speaker, who's probably somebody as colleague in the corner. Uh, what we try to do <coughs> in uh, in these sessions. Hi, Michael. <laughs> no, no, no way. Just so many people to talk. I to. know. That's, uh, what what we try to do in in in, in these sessions is to ask some of the questions that patients always ask us. How many embryos do you put back? What's the pregnancy rate? What's the twin rate? What's the miscarriage rate? Uh, how's the pregnancy managed? How do you manage the delivery, etc., etc., etc.? So we ask our panel, and since some of you weren't here yesterday, I'll just quickly ask our panel to introduce themselves. And Michael, you... I'm Dr. Michael Feynman, HRC Fertility in Encino, California. I'm Dr. Uber Ruiz from CFAM uh, Corporate in Mexico City. I'm Dr. Michael Kettle from San Diego Fertility Center in California. I'm Ioannis Yakmaikis from Mediterranean Center in Greece, Crete, Greece. Okay, thank you. Now, the, num the number of eggs we get, I mean, huge people think that huge numbers of eggs are good. It, that's not necessarily so. Uh, we all have numbers that we like to get. So let's start, Michael Feynman. What's your ideal number of eggs? What do you aim for, and do you tailor your treatment to try and get a certain number? I think the optimal number is 10 to 20. Uh, and yes, I do try to, as best we can, uh, um, as you said, ta tailor the treatment to get that number. On a first go, it's hard to know, but if we've had a, a lady that's done it before um, in this room, that's not a problem. Uh, it, then. Uh, then we would you know, possibly alter the dose to get it into that range. So if they've been low, we might try for more. If they've been high, I actually will, will pull back mm -hmm. on doses. There was a study recently that uh, when women had high AMH levels, you've heard about that as a measure of ovarian reserve, mm -hmm. when these women got more eggs, they didn't necessarily get more embryos. So there's, there is a, probably a, a point at which it's the law of diminishing returns, in my opinion and experience. Yeah. Dr. Jacobarkis, what, what do you do? Do you have an ideal number? Yes, I mean, uh, there are two options. One is that uh, stimulation uh, is against the quality of uh, the oocytes because they are higher percentages of aneuploidies. Or some other uh, doctors, uh, they say there is no difference. So, I think uh, always, if we choose one blastocyst, at least uh, for the first time, as an embryo transfer, is uh, wise. Yeah. Uh, then we take under uh, consideration all the parameters, and then we see how we proceed. Right, right. But, and, and what's your ideal number of eggs? I mean, Michael has said he likes between 10 and 20. Is that what you like to get? I would say uh, the less you take, the best quality should be. Yeah, fair comment. Uh, then, then really we come on to the, the vexed question, which is a lot of international discussion. This is the number of embryos you put back. Do Dr. Barber, how many embryos do you put back in Mexico? What's, what's the range? We normally put two embryo, mm -hmm. but uh, we also do the uh, single embryo transfer. You do? It is depending on the quality and if uh, we have performed the biopsy of, of a one generation of embryo. Right. Okay. Um, you decide on the, the embryo numbers based on, on the quality of the embryo? Mm, yes, yeah, it yeah. is the quality of the embryo. And also, if uh, we have performed a PGS test, uh, it will be a gender selection uh, right. or uh, chromosomal count. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kettle, yesterday you, <coughs> you were talking about doing PGD on embryos and transferring single embryos. Mm -hmm. I presume you don't do PGD on all your embryos, do, do you? No, we don't. Um, to expand on how many embryos we typically transfer last year, our average number of embryos transferred was, was, was 1.7. So that means there are um, many circumstances where we transfer a single embryo, but also um, many, tra many transfers are, are two embryo transfers. Um, not to say that we haven't put in three embryos depending upon special circumstances 
Dr. Feynman was alluding to embryo quality and, and other and other factors that might age of the woman that might influence that decision. But mm -hmm. sort of one to two would certainly be uh, a fair answer to that. Yeah, yeah. And in the American clinics, uh, Dr. Feynman, who makes the decision on the number to transfer? Is this, is this the clinician, the embryologist? Is the patient involved? Is the surrogate involved in these decisions? Oh yeah, everybody should be involved. Uh, the way I do it with surrogacy is um, I first take the couple into a private room to discuss it. It's their private information. And there are contractual arrangements many times that, that discuss the numbers, so we have to be careful not to be bre breaching that contract. Um, and then uh, I present it to, we come in, I, then I go alone to the surrogate and say, this is what we want to do. Are you okay with it? And you know, nine, these are women who want to please. So I mean, ninety percent of the time they say yes. Uh, if I've if I've blown it and not realized there's a contractual restriction, uh, it's often the surrogate who will remind me of it, uh, and then we renegotiate a little bit. And, and in case you will call the agency, who are our best resource to make sure we're doing everything right. And you know, it's seldom a conflict. But I think both everybody involved has to give, be given the respect of participating. You can't, you know, you have to. I mean. This woman's involved, so we, we that's how we do. We, we we try to be discreet and and then not. I, I don't want the couple and the surrogate in the room arguing over it. That's ugly. It happened once to us, uh, and it was horrible. So um, you know, I try to avoid that. Um, so you know, it's, it's everybody together. The embryologist will pipe in if needed, but they they give me very good reports on the embryo quality. Of course, if there's been PGD done, that that yeah. you know that yeah. trumps a lot of it. Yeah. What's the situation in Greece, Dr. Giacomakis? Who, who makes the decision on how many embryos to transfer? Is the patient involved? Is the surrogate involved? Mainly is the clinician because he will take care of the... also for the result, also for the following up and the delivery of the surrogate. So, uh, certainly, we talk with uh, the zero gate. We explain here the differences. Uh, it's always a dilemma because uh, sometimes it happens to the same zero gate. When you transfer one, you don't you get a negative result. When you transfer two, they're twins. Uh, but anyway. Uh, always the initial uh, decision it would be to transfer to start with one blastocyst. Right. And Dr. Barber, in, in, in Mexico, who's involved in the decision making process? Is it, it is also everybody involved. Yeah, terrific. Terrific. And obviously, as Dr. Feynman was commenting this morning, not all started cycles actually get to the stage of of embryo transfer. There's always failures along the way. So, uh, Dr. Barber, in, in uh, Mexico, what percentage of patients who have, uh, who start on the program, what percentage of them get to have an embryo put back? Well, uh, speaking about the surrogacy program, um, most of the, the, the cycles are performed with egg donation because uh, different uh, medical matters. So we have uh, around 70% of all the uh, IVF programs which end in the embryos. What would be the situation in your clinic, Dr. Kettle? How many, what percentage would get to transfer? Uh, certainly depends upon the circumstances, like Dr. Barbara was, was de describing. In, in an egg donor cycle, I would say way, way over 95%. Mm -hmm. um, end up with an embryo transfer. Um, compare that to a woman in her 40s using her own eggs where maybe only half might get to transfer. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in Greece, Dr. Giacomakis, if... Uh Usually, uh, when we finish uh, the consultation, usually all the couples, they go on because we make clear from the very beginning, we try, we have a, a completely different policy than uh, OSI donation or conventional yeah. IVF, because we try to explain to the couple all the problems that they could happen in between. Like so, so, uh, so, sorry, I'm sorry. Patient comes onto the program and she starts on her treatment. 
what percentage of those patients actually get as far as having an embryo put back? High percentage. What? Because we, we explained them before, uh, the oocyte uh, quality, the sperm quality, uh, so w w we tell them what it should happen, what they should decide yeah. if we have to stop in between. So we, uh, 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 a part that is not uh, the most pleasant situation, but we bring out all the possible problems so they know till the end <coughs> what is going to happen. And they get the decision according to that. Okay, okay. And uh, of course the big question is, percentage of your patients fall by the wayside before they get to embryo transfer, then you have the patients who have the embryo transfer, and the next question obviously is what's the clinical pregnancy rate? We, uh, in this country, just a positive blood test, uh, we don't count as a pregnancy. Uh, we count a pregnant as a pregnancy uh, when we can see a fetal heart on, on ultrasound. Uh, so Dr. Barber, in, in, in your clinic in Mexico, What's your clinical pregnancy rate per embryo transfer procedure? After the embryo transfer. After the embryo okay. transfer. Well, how, so how, it's what percentage? 60. It's around 60. Around 60. Yes. Uh, Dr. Feynman, in your clinic. Well, of course, it, it varies widely based on age and circumstance. Dr. Barber mentioned a lot of their transfers are uh, egg donors, so that's a reasonable number. Uh, for women over 40, the, the live birth rate is about 10%. Um, that's without PGD. Uh, it, now, with PGD in a 40-year-old, if she gets the normal embryo, of course, that number is going to go up per transfer, but per started cycle, it's going to be low. Uh, the women in, in, you know, in the mid-30s, we're, we're, we're getting close to, uh, the, close to the, the egg donor rate, so there is surrogacy for me overall. All comers uh, through the years working lo largely with CSP and other reputable agencies is about a 50% pregnancy rate with surrogacy. You, you know, you're getting the <coughs> ideal embryo in the ideal environment. Right. And in Greece, <coughs> Dr. Giacomakis, what's the, what's the clinical pregnancy rate yes. for embryo transfer? Sorry, you mentioned uh, also biochemical or positive? No, no. Positive, uh, positive, sound positive. positive heart, heart on mate. ultrasound. Okay. It's uh, around 60%. Yeah, lovely. Lovely. And the next, of course, vexed question is multiple pregnancies. What's your multiple pregnancy rate? It's about uh, 12%. About 20? 12. 12. Now, <coughs> Dr. Kerting, in your clinic, I mean, you tend to transfer one, 1.7 mm -hmm. embryos. What do you end up with as a multiple pregnancy rate? So I like to, I like to counsel patients about that based on a two embryo transfer. I mean, obviously, with a one embryo transfer, you can still get uh, identical twinning, but that's rare. So with a two embryo transfer in an egg donor patient, I, I counsel them that about 40% of those pregnancies are going to be twin pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you would think the same, Dr. Feynman. Uh, Dr. Barber, most of your cases, of course, are, are, are egg donors, aren't they? Most of, most yes. of you, you said that most of most your cases, of cases are egg donation. Um, and you're transferring two embryos. What, what's, what's your twin rate? It is around 35 percent. And uh, and then the next thing, of course, now we've got down to actually having a having embryos on ultrasound. Uh, every embryo on ultrasound doesn't go on to produce a baby. There's a miscarriage rate associated with it, and for some uh, reason, we take miscarriages up to 20 weeks in this country and we consider anything delivered after 20 weeks uh, as a live birth or a stillbirth. Uh, sounds, always sounds crazy to me that we do that, because if you deliver a baby at 21 weeks, it's got no prospect of success, and that really, I think, ought to be, ought to be classed as a late miscarriage. But uh, the powers that be say that live births start after 20 weeks. So the question is, what's the loss rate? Dr. Feynman, what's, what's your loss rate between fetal heart and 20 weeks? Yeah, well, again, it depends on the age of the woman, mostly. Uh, the miscarriage rate for 40-year-olds in a non-PGD tested embryo is 50%. Um, and, you know, in the younger women, um, egg donors probably in the, you know, ranges 10 to 20%, and we hope that we cut into that with PGD testing. Has not yet, to my knowledge, you know, my good friend Dr. Carroll has seen one, that no one has really been able to come up with a good controlled study to show that it's actually lowered, but we intuitively believe it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Dr. Barber, your, your miscarriage rate? We are around 14 percent. About 14. <coughs> and in Greece, Dr. Giacomakis? Around 15 percent. 14, 15. And I presume, Dr. Kettle, you're pretty much the same as uh, Yeah, Dr. I, I mean, I, I really am 
a believer in, in, in genetic screening. And if you do PGS and you get a pregnancy, the miscarriage rate there, I, I believe to be very low, somewhere <coughs> probably in the 5% or less range. Uh, in an untested embryo transfer, I, I would, again, egg donor model, about 15%, I think is reasonable. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the next thing is, you've got past the miscarriage state, so the poor patients have, have, have got these ongoing problems. Do I get as far as having eggs collected? Did the eggs get fertilized? Have I got embryos? Uh, embryos go back. Uh, next thing is the blood test. The blood test is positive. We don't count that as a pregnancy, so the patient now then waits for that six-week ultrasound, they've actually got a baby there. They've got a baby there. The next thing they wait for is to see where they get past the miscarriage stakes because uh, if you get past that, uh, that, that, that miscarriage time, uh, then the loss rate after that uh, is very, very small indeed, but it's not zero. So in, in this country, we push very, very hard for reporting results as live birth rates, uh, either per started cycle or per egg collection or more commonly per embryo transfer. So Dr. Feynman, what's your live birth rate per embryo transfer? Uh, that's, well, you, you should have told me when you asked me that ahead of time. Um, <laughs> well again, it, it's pretty you know, age related. Uh, the, the, as I mentioned before, the live birth rate per, for 40 year olds is about 10%. Um, the, the, the fall off rate after 12 weeks is about 2 to 3% if it's a single birth and in fact my my first visit here was predicated on discussing why there was a high second trimester loss rate in India, and it was clearly through multiple pregnancies. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's the big difference. And the, 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 the loss rate at the second trimester is much higher in the, in the uh, twin situation. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Barber, what's, uh, what's your life birth rate per embryo transfer? After the 12 week uh, and reaching to the final stage of the pregnancy, I will say that we we will still have losses around nine percent. The others ended in, uh, in the natural birth. Right. This is from this is from uh, embryo transfer on. It's about nine percent. Yes. Yeah. Um, in Greece, Dr. Jakimakis, what's what what's your live birth rate per embryo transfer? Yes, because we have to go against uh, statistics, and uh, we we do take care, if I should say special care, I mean we check uh, very often the cervix, we check all the infectious situations, etc., etc. We monitor them often, we try so they don't have more contractions than usual. So well, we have a high uh, birth rate. You meant after 20, 12 weeks? No, for, 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 for every embryo transfer procedure you do, what's the percentage life birth rate? Do 100 embryo it's transfer procedures, how many babies? It's definitely over 60, 70%. Right. Terrific. Um, Dr. Kettle, I, I, I wanted to ask you, who manages the pregnancy in your unit? I mean, do you manage your own pregnancies? Do you working closely with, an with, a, with a colleague who switched on to the idea of IVF pregnancies? So the model in the United States is that the fertility practices and the obstetrical practices in almost all circumstances are separate. Yeah. And so we would initiate a pregnancy and monitor the pregnancy through most of the first trimester, but then the patient is transferred on to um, a separate practice of, of obstetrician gynecologists who manage her pregnancy from that point <coughs> forward. We keep in touch with the, with the patient and with the obstetrician throughout the course of that pregnancy, um, but don't participate in any of the decision making. Right, right. So, but but you, you, you pick an obstetrician who's, who's very switched on to the, the problems of the IVF patient. Yes, we have a sort of a cadre of obstetricians that we work with that are quite familiar with the process. Yeah. yeah. Very important. And I, I presume, Dr. Feynman, yours is the same situation? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Barber, who, who manages the pregnancies in, in, in Mexico? As a corporate, we have all the areas. Uh, so from the beginning to the end, it is us. You the deliver clinic. Your clinic looks oh. after them. <coughs> yes, of course. Yeah. What happens in Greece, Dr. Giacomarcus? Do you look after the pregnancies yourself? Deliver the babies? Absolutely. Because uh, usually the couple is away. So we uh, I'm responsible in a way for the couple, yeah. for the surrogate, yeah. 
and uh, that's more uh, responsibility than usual. So I have to take close care. You look up, yeah. We, we, we in, in Canberra, we're probably the only unit in the country where we have uh, two of the, uh, the clinicians, also obstetricians, and, and, and manage the pregnancies. Uh, but I, I think I'm right in saying we're the only unit in the country. Um, David Healy in Melbourne used to deliver them, but David sadly is no longer with us. And I, I think with his passing, we're the only clinic that continues to do it. Good luck, Skip. What I think a lot of people are interested in is the philosophy regarding delivery. Now, uh, you know, there, there are clinics in India who do elective caesareans at 37 weeks, as, as, as we all know. Uh, a lot of them induce their patients pre-term. Uh, what's the philosophy in, in your clinic about delivery? Do you, do you await spontaneous labor? Do you induce them? Well, as Dr. Keller said, we, we, don't, we don't meddle in that. Um, we, we're there to support, but I, I would say personally I would be against elective C-section for everybody. Um, and so we, we rely on our excellent obstetrical colleagues to do the right thing. If I'm asked, you know, occasionally the patient will ask me my opinion on something. I'll, I am an obstetrician gynecologist mm -hmm. after all. Uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll advise them along obstetrical mm -hmm. guidelines. P the vaginal birth is the preferred uh, method of delivery. What, what about in Mexico, Dr. Barber? What, mm -hmm. what happens? Well, uh, Dr. Feynman has already asked uh, uh, and answered all the questions. Uh, it is an, a specific medical decision on each and every case. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will have to end uh, the, the, the pregnancy depending on, on how the surrogate is going, how the pregnancy is going to, to turn. And uh, it could be a, an elective uh, surgical procedure, a serum or an athola birth. Okay? Right, right. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 the, the, the fact that it's a surrogacy pregnancy doesn't influence that no. decision. No. What about in Greece, Dr. Giacomarcus? Do you, do you have a, do you manage them like every yes. other patient? We, we happen to know uh, surrogates a lot before you, before we uh, put them into the program. So we know the reaction in general, but uh, uh, the philosophy is that uh, a cesarean should be first choice. We are looking for a cesarean. Right, right. Can I, am I allowed to what, caveat? To say why? <laughs> no, 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 I don't want to challenge everybody here, but uh, one little caveat. Um, in the United States, uh, twin pregnancies are almost always delivered by C-section now. I, I was a pretty aggressive <coughs> vaginal birth after C-section kind of person and all that, but for twins, I don't think there are obstetricians left that have the skill Terrific. to deal with it. Um, so what you're often asking a surrogate to go through is a C-section when she could have had a vaginal birth. And th that's one of the factors that dissuades women from coming back to be a surrogate again if they've had to have a C-section for twins. I, I, I think that's true. Uh, some years ago, I was at a, a meeting on twins. And one of the presentations, was a 20 minute presentation uh, by a chap from Israel on the subject of how will we deliver the second twin in the future? And he got up and said, <coughs> in the future, we will deliver all second twins by cesarean section because there won't be enough obstetricians around with the skill to manage the second twin. He said, that concludes my lecture. What should we talk about now? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the, the, the big question and the worrying question for a lot of us is the prematurity rate. Um, the number of babies born under 34 weeks now, if you're getting singletons, the chance of that's pretty small. But overall, in your clinic, Dr. Kettle, uh, what would the prematurity rate be? Uh, let, let, let's say severe prematurity, less yeah. than 30 weeks and then the others. Yeah, I, I mean, I think fortunately that, that's becoming a rare and rare event. Uh, the, certainly the incidence of high order multiples, triplets or greater, mm -hmm. is almost zero nowadays. And those were the pregnancies that, that were the most susceptible to the, to the very premature delivery. Uh, and yet you still get pre premature deliveries. I, I mean, as Dr. Feynman said, my practice doesn't manage the obstetrics, so I can't give you um, specific statistics, but I would certainly say the, the very preemie, less than 34 weeks, has is, is got to be small, less, certainly less than 5%. Splendid. Uh, in Greece, Dr. Jacomarcus, what's your prematurity rate? Uh, we try the most during the pregnancy. We supply cortisone. To for the maturation mm -hmm. of the respiratory system as 
soon as possible. We try to, when it happens, we try to manage the delivery with uh, uh, the most quick and uh, gentle uh, way. Well, what so what, what percentage of them are premature? It's uh, fortunately it's very low, well, very very low. Yeah, and, and Dr. Barber, your your clinic, and you're transferring two embryos. You've got a fairly Let low twin rate for that. But what's the twin rate? Less than 30 weeks is uh, three percent, mm -hmm. and less than 34 weeks is around six percent. Splendid. I mean, the, the, these are much more encouraging figures than when I first ran this sort of session about about three years ago, uh, where the twin rates were much much higher and the prematurity and the loss rates were, were higher. We're getting to the end of time, but I, I, I've, I've been asked to put a question to you all um, about cost and whether you have a sort of a package deal, whether the patient pays a set sum of money which covers her for perhaps up to three attempts or three embryo transfers. Dr. Feynman, do you have any of those deals going? Uh, we do have package pricing. Oddly enough, for, um, for egg donors, people usually don't elect it because it's a little ex more expensive. Um, and the frozen transfers are not that relatively expensive, so it, it doesn't work out. We actually have refund programs too, and they're a little, I mean, they're costly, but you know, we have a refund program if, and it's based on age and, and whether there's an egg donor involved and so forth. I don't know the cost, but you know, they're, they're up there, but um, we try to, we're, we're somewhere on the modestly price side in California. Our two, our two cycle plans are comparable to some people's single cycle, mm -hmm. and to me, the refund is certainly worth looking at. And Dr. Kettle, in, in your unit? In yeah, we have um, several options. Uh, we like to call them risk-sharing options, where there's a, a, a shared risk between the, the intended parent and the, and the center, and probably our most popular shared risk plan, uh, we call success guarantee plan. It, it doesn't really guarantee success, but if it, if you, if it, doesn't, <laughs> result, you know, it doesn't result in a pregnancy, uh, you get your money back, which is a pretty wonderful place to be, and uh, provides a lot of a lot of peace of mind. It's sort of like a, sometimes I call it, it's like a bet on a set of embryos. So <laughs> we're going to bet that in that set of embryos, you're going to have a baby. And it may be with the fresh transfer, it may be with subsequent frozen transfers. It, this program really helps with the single embryo transfer process yeah. because they don't have, the patients don't feel that compelling pressure uh, because it's so costly to, to get a pregnancy going. So if you're just looking at the whole set of embryos, um, you can do single embryo transfers, you know, once, twice, whatever, and, and, and still not have that, uh, that financial outlay because the subsequent transfers, there's no cost, there's, there's no cost for those. It's, a, it's sort of a one payment event. You know, uh, if, I, if I don't mind interjecting, many years ago, Dr. Sh when I was with Dr. Sher, we, we started the, a refund program like yeah. that. We got excoriated in the press that we would put back more embryos to achieve a pregnancy rate quickly to, so we wouldn't give the money back. But it was the opposite, like you said. Mm -hmm. it, it started my road down putting less and less embryos, so I felt less pressure to get that pregnancy quick. It was on my dime, mm -hmm. but, you know, uh, we wanted a good outcome, and, and it was actually an incentive to, to put in less embryos. I agree with you. Dr. Jack Marcus, do you, do you have a sort of a package deal for your patients, or do they pay every time? No, the, the intended parents, they pay on every stage because we happen to, before we start the program, we should present to, not the couple necessary, but we have to present to a court to get a court decision and approval from the court mm -hmm. counsel mm -hmm. in order to start. So they have to, uh, first, they have a compensation about the lawyer uh, and uh, some expenses uh, in the very beginning, and then uh, the intended parents they have to uh, pay stay, uh, step by step uh, the expenses the of the program. <laughs> and Dr. Barber, in, in your unit, do you have package deals or do they pay each time? Yes, we have uh, some different packages, mm -hmm. but it depends on if uh, the client is going to ship eggs um, or shipping embryos. Uh, if they need some uh, specific amount of embryo transfers regarding the, the amount of embryo mm -hmm. they are shipping. We have also r refund uh, packages. We, we have a secure baby program mm -hmm. which ends uh, until the, the, the IPs have a, a, a baby at home. And uh, uh, I see that nobody is going to be, uh, be giving prices, so neither do I. So. <laughs> we can make a, 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 a one option for you.
Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that, that really brings us to the end of the session. Um, we've got a lot to get through this morning, so we don't really have time for questions, I'm afraid, but I'm sure these gentlemen are around uh, during the lunch break if you'd like to buttonhole them and ask them specific things. So I'd like you to thank our panel for their contributions. <laughs>